Hello, Hope Community Church. My name is Connor Cement. I'm one of the elders here at Hope Community Church, and I get the privilege of bringing the message this week. This is my first time preaching here at Hope. Um, a little bit about me. <clears throat> I'm usually the guy uh, standing in the back of the church, the tailgating section with the baby on the swing. That's where you can find me on most Sundays. Um, I, For work, I'm a me mechanical engineer. Um, and a fun fact is I've ridden my bike across the country, my bicycle across the country, five separate times. And during today's testimony, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that first time I rode my bike across the country and what an impact it had on me. Uh, let's start with some prayer. God, you've given each of us a deposit of your Holy Spirit. And I pray that today, through my sharing of my story, just telling about how I encounter you, that it can resonate with people and it can um, just excite the Holy Spirit that is within them and push them closer to you. In your name I pray. Amen. So I'd like to start off my faith journey story by talking about my grandma, my bopshi, which is the Polish word for grandma. Uh, I spent a ton of time with my bopshi. I loved her. I looked up to her a ton. Uh, she was just a sweet fruit of the Spirit kind of lady. She just embodied um, all those fruits of the Spirit, patience, kindness, gentleness, um, and I just wanted to be like her. So she was a Catholic, so that meant while I was growing up, I kind of followed the regimented path of an early Catholic. Um, I got baptized as a baby, but I went to Sunday school. I did, received my first Holy Communion, and I was confirmed at around age 14. And that confirmation confirmation process was meant to be a claiming of my faith for my own. Um, it's kind of like what you see in an early believer's baptism, maybe in, in a Baptist church, um, where a young adult will claim their faith as their own and get baptized. But for me in that Catholic structure, it was a single day for everybody who was that age to come all together and s confess faith together and then get the picture with the bishop af afterwards. <laughs> so. Um, at around age 14, I was going through my CCD, my Sunday school process, and there was only one Sunday school left. And so on the last night of Sunday school, they took us into the sanctuary of the church, and they spread us all around for a time of independent prayer and reflection, and they dimmed the lights in the church. So the lights are down low, and I remember vividly sitting there in a pew looking up at the crucifix, which was the only thing that was lit in the church, and that was, so there's a lit up image um, sculpture you might say of Jesus hanging on the cross and that's all you can see and in that moment I was kind of wrestling I knew I was going through the motions and it felt like at that moment I had the chance to give God the opportunity to tell me if he was there or not so staring at that crucifix I just prayed honestly and I said God show me a sign that you're here show me a sign that you're out there and that I should commit my life to following you um, and I waited maybe 30 seconds or so, and I didn't see anything that caught my eye. I didn't hear anything. So I thought to myself, I think I've given God a chance, and I don't think he's actually there. So the next day, I went through the confirmation process. I still said the words, but they were hollow. I took the picture with the bishop. My bop, she was happy, but I kind of wiped my hands with it, and I thought, I don't really think he's out there and I'm just going to go about with my life. So fast forward a little bit. I'm graduating college. I'm 22 years old. I'm staring down post-grad life. Um, it's kind of daunting, kind of exciting. I feel like big things are expected of me, and really I just want to take my freedom from school, and I just want to go ride my bike. I want to go on an adventure. So before starting a career, I first look for cross-country bicycle rides to join. Um, I couldn't find a bicycle ride, an organized ride that I could afford, and I wasn't mentally prepared to take out on my own across the country. But I kept looking and kept looking, and what I stumbled upon was an organization called the Fuller Center for Housing, which is a Christian faith-based affordable housing nonprofit that runs cross-country bike rides as fundraisers for their mission. So what I had ultimately stumbled upon was a way to ride my bike cross country with an organized ride, somebody else planning it for me, and to get other people to pay for it. 
because I would masquerade my cycling ambitions as philanthropy and collect donations from friends and family. And it worked. It worked. So I joined the Fuller Center um, Bicycle Adventure. Uh, well, let me back up a second. My parents were a little skeptical of all this. They thought, oh, this bike riding thing, they kind of, they could, they could sniff me out. They knew I kind of just wanted to do this indefinitely. So they said, line up a job for August so that it doesn't become an indefinite thing and then you can go on this bike ride. So I dotted my T's, crossed my eyes, I lined up an engineering job back home for August, but I went out on this bike ride. And within two weeks, I wanted to just do this indefinitely, and I was excited about it. I actually, I got excited about the mission of the Fuller Center, um, and then the bike riding was everything I ever hoped it would be. And I learned there was a position opening at the uh, Fuller Center Bike Adventure for the uh, next summer. So I approached the boss on the ride and asked uh, if I could fill that position, if I could have that job. Um, he told me that I should take four weeks. Take four weeks, keep riding, keep understanding who the ride is and, and, and think about it some more and then we'll talk again. Well, that night after talking to the boss, I, I was, whether or not I got that job, I just felt deeply this is the direction I'm going. That engineering job back home is not for me. So I emailed them and resigned the job that I never actually worked. Four weeks go by, I talked to my boss, uh, future boss again, and I don't think anybody else had applied, so I won the position. Um, then was the point for the faith conversation. Because it wasn't news to anybody that I wasn't a Christian. And the Fuller Center for Housing is a Christian faith-based organization. So there's a bit of a rub there. I knew this conversation was going to come up and I kind of mentally prepared for it. And so I told my boss, I said, I'm not a Christian and I can't guarantee you that next year I will be a Christian. But all I can commit to you is that within this year's time, I will study Christianity and I will understand it enough to be able to hold space for Christian people on the ride, to hold this Christian setting that other people can participate in. He said, OK, he said, that's all he could genuinely ask me to do and but he had one more request which was when I moved to Georgia to work with the Fuller Center I would attend his church I had no problem with that I kind of treated it as a class to learn how to speak Christian so I would go once a week to that without any qualms all that to say God was setting a scene he was setting up a life and people that were going to be around me in Georgia um, and he was also planting seeds along that ride. The person who most of those seeds came through was a lady named Dodie O'Dell. Um, and I want to tell you three times along that ride that Dodie said impactful words to me. The first time was during a church service I was required to attend in Page, Arizona. I was standing and listening to a song and in this church worship service and sh something just shot me right in the heart. And I began crying in that sanctuary, very confused at what was going on and why these emotions were welling up. I felt some connection possibly to my bopsy, my grandma who had passed away years before. Um, but ultimately, I just didn't understand why I was having such a reaction to the setting I was in. Well, Dodie happened to be standing next to me in that moment. And she leaned over and she whispered, Dude Man, which was her nickname for me, Dude Man, you got the Holy Spirit in you. And that was really impactful for me to hear because at that time I didn't think that was possible. I didn't think that the Holy Spirit was something that you could have without having all your act together, without coming to God with a clean record, and then He would give you that. I I didn't think it was possible, ultimately, I didn't think it was possible to be pursued by God before you pursued Him. And her telling me that I had the Holy Spirit in me really affirmed God was pursuing me, and that's how it ultimately works, I think. God takes the first step towards you. The next thing that Dodie told me that was impactful actually came while having drinking beers together at a picnic table outside the First Southern Baptist Church of Monticello, Utah, which is not where you should be drinking beer, and I didn't know it at the time, so I'm sorry to all the Baptists out there. Um, but 
Dodie said another important thing to me. She said, dude, man, God don't care about a little cussing and drinking. He wants your heart, which again was just very emphasizing to me that I didn't have to have it all together to pursue God. I didn't have to clean up or, 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 or fake my life and, or, or achieve some level of morality before a relationship with, with God was possible and ultimately before God wanted a relationship with me. Um, so she kind of chipped away at my pre preconceived notions about what prerequisites I needed to accomplish before speaking with God. And that was really impactful to me. I had drinking to clean up. I had cussing to clean up. <laughs> but God didn't wait for me to do that to meet me. I was able to meet him. And he worked on me over years in a lot of really cool ways. The third thing Dodie um, impacted me with was pointing me to someone who would later mentor and shepherd me from afar. But what she said was, dude, man, if you're going to get into reading the Bible and all, you should look up this pastor in New York City. His church is Redeemer or something or other, and his sermons are really good. That pastor she was referring to was the late Tim Keller, and his sermons have been instrumental in my Overcoming Objections, which is one of his great sermon series. Overcoming objections based in our cultural secular mindset that I didn't I didn't think was my belief set until I started looking more at Christianity and looking the truth of Christianity and then realizing that I was coming to it with a belief set that was contrary to it in a lot of ways. So he was super instrumental and I highly recommend that series, especially to people who are first seeking God. Um, all that to say, my, my spirit was being stirred along the ride, but I wasn't actively seeking it. And my future boss wanted to nudge me along. So he, uh, he voluntold me that I would be leading a devotion. Um, when we had these devotions before every day's ride, maybe a five minute, somebody would share something that was meaningful to them. 90% of the time it was based on scripture or, or Christian teaching. So he, he tasked me with, hey, why don't you look in the Bible find something worth sharing, and share tomorrow. So in Syracuse, New York, I had homework, and I borrowed a Bible, and I plopped it on its spine and let the pages fall where they would, since I had no idea where to look in this thing. <laughs> um, and it opened roughly in the middle to the book of Ecclesiastes. The passage that I plopped open to and started reading was something I never expected to find in the Bible. It sounded like atheist ponderings. That's because the passage I opened to was, in fact, atheist ponderings. And there, we need to pause and add some context to what I found myself reading. So let's get context for Ecclesiastes. It was likely written by Solomon, the most wise and wealthy man in Jerusalem in his day, and he was speaking to an assembly as a teacher or pastor. He spends much of the book exploring a secular thought experiment, so a, thought, a line of thought that has no spiritual or religious basis to it, purely of the world, what's around you, and that's it. He emphasizes that he's in this mode of thinking by repeating the phrase under the sun while exploring the meaning of life without God. I didn't know that context when I first opened it and first started reading. I just encountered passages like this. Ecclesiastes 3.19 Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so the other dies. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over the animals. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward and if the animal spirit goes down to the earth? In Ecclesiastes 9, 2, it says, All share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good, so with the sinful. And this kind of resonated with my secular mindset at the time that I, I honestly didn't think there was an afterlife. I thought what it felt like pre-being born is probably what it felt like after dying. So it kind of resonated with me that, yeah, that whether you're righteous or you're wicked or good or bad, like we're all just going to die and then just be fertilizer afterwards. So it, it, it resonated with me and I found it to be like true and profound but it also confused me a lot that I was reading this in the Bible. So 
I was hoping there was some conclusion to the matter, some, some way to tie a nice bow on it all. And fortunately, the final passage of Ecclesiastes is entitled, The Conclusion of the Matter. So we can read together, if you want to read with me, in Ecclesiastes, it would be chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, way at the end of the book, um, and they read like this. Now all has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. This is the duty, the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. And at this point, my enthusiasm for the book probably waned a lot because I was resonating with the, you know, if you're good or you're bad, you, all the same fate is for everybody. But then I get to this part and it's telling me that God will judge everything and that the final conclusion of the matter is to follow God and follow all his commandments, which to me at that time felt like enslavement. So in two words, I found enslavement to God, enslavement and judgment. Two things that I was trying to avoid at that time in my prodigal mode. Um, so the conclusion of the matter didn't rest, it resonate, but something had. So I had something to take with me to the devotion. I was <laughs> captivated by the meaninglessness, the, the same fate meets all. And so the next morning I woke up into about a group of about 30 people who had ridden over 3,000 miles. They were about 90% of the way from California to Maine. Uh, I got up and announced to them that this monumental accomplishment that they were on the verge of grasping was total vanity and utterly meaningless. <laughs> Which, as you can imagine, was kind of uh, a little uninspiring. <laughs> but... That's what I had taken away from my trip to the Bible. Um, after I finished that ride, uh, I moved to America's Georgia, where the headquarters of the Fuller Center is, and I started working for the Fuller Center for Housing. I ended up working for the Fuller Center for four years, uh, and I would plan rides in the fall, winter, and spring in America's Georgia, and then each summer I would go and lead a cross-country bicycle adventure. While I was, while I was in America's, I did follow through on my promise to study Christianity. Um, my search was definitely a stumble, two steps forward, one step back but, back, but the truth of Scripture slowly overtook me. I went into that study eager to find how Christianity was false or hypocritical. And what I found was something truer than anything I had ever encountered. And I think I'm super grateful for how God pulled me to himself because honestly a lot of times a lot of time God finds people in their lowest point you know it takes it takes rock bottom to reach out to your creator when you feel like you're at the end of your rope and that can certainly be a way to encounter God but it it it, it brings up the possibility that ultimately you're using God Right? It brings up the possibility that once things start going your way, then you'll think that you got it in control again, and it kind of opens a door to, or an exit ramp to your faith walk. Um, but God brought me to himself in a way <laughs> that um, I wasn't expecting, and it was, it was completely kind of academic when I, when I went to pursue him. And I was pursuing him to, to prove him wrong, but in finding him completely true, it then like glued me to him. And no matter my circumstances, I had found something that was true and worth following uh, regardless of how my life was going. And that has remained true throughout my walk. Um, so I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I do want to revisit Ecclesiastes from another mindset. So I'm going to be looking here at Ecclesiastes 12, starting at verse, or I'm just looking at verse 11 right now. And it says, the words of the wise are like goads. They're collective, collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. So I'd look up goad. A goad is a stick with a pointy end used to whack the hindquarters of a donkey or an oxen to get its attention 
to get that stubborn beast to move in a different direction, to bump it off course. And it, and it hurts a bit, and it's supposed to. Um, so the, the words of the wise are like goad. So now when I look back at Ecclesiastes, I find the goad that it was intended to be. Um, and uh, this particular goad has to do with enslavement. So I want to look at uh, I want to look at Solomon and how he had everything you could possibly imagine. So this was man like endless estates, possessions, comforts of life, and for a period of his life he worked hard to build that even more. And he was very successful at it. And in chapter two, verse seventeen, he reflects on his extremely successful endeavors. He says, "So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me." all of it meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had told for under the sun because I must leave them to the one that comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool, yet he will have control over all the work into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. Solomon's frustration reminds me to give God the reins of my life again. Tim Keller says, freedom is choosing the most liberating constraints in every situation. And I know that the freest I will ever be is when I'm constrained only by the one who knew me and loved me when he knit me in my mother's womb. I'm to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and mind, and love my neighbor as myself, and all their, all their ways of living are enslavements that will ultimately drive me to the ground. And most of them are ones that Solomon has already explored and been fully successful at and then been fully just torn apart when he realizes what he's given his life to. Ecclesiastes helps me see that future of my life if I stray from God and try and live for my own means of building up whatever I'm trying to build. But apart from God, you will find yourself in a destination that is despair of what you've built and the futility of it and the meaninglessness of it if you're not doing it with God. The second thing that Ecclesiastes means to me now is, is a completely different view of judgment. So when I first read it, the enslavement to God was really off-putting to me. The judgment from God was really off-putting to me. And I think the judgment from God was really off-putting to me because it made me cringe at the parts of me that I didn't want other people to see or know. Um, and those are the things that were out in plain sight, let alone all the things that I knew about myself that nobody else would possibly know, but that a potentially omnipotent God would know. Um, and that is what I ran from. The more I think about it, I was missing another piece. I was missing all the, the, the hard work that is done in life and all the good that is done in life by people. And how if you throw out judgment completely, you're throwing out the possibility for what you do in your life to matter. So, and the more I studied Christianity, the more aware I became of my faults. So I have, I have this a very different judgment problem now, which is that I need a judgment. Like deep down, I want there to be judgment so that the good of this world matters so the kindness that human beings show to each other matters but i can't stand that judgment because i know deep down my flaws and my brokenness and i know that on my own two feet i can't stand in front of god if he's going to judge everything and which ecclesiastes says he will the good and the bad the hidden and the exposed This leads me to explore some of the Gospels for help on this judgment problem. So in Matthew 25, Jesus tells his disciples that there will be a, a judge that presides over the final judgment of the world and that what we do on earth will be the basis of our judgment. This is the passage where Jesus talks about when you fed me, or when I was hungry, you fed me, and when I was thirsty, you gave me a drink, and so on. And his disciples say, well, when did we see you hungry and give you food? And when did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? And Jesus tells them, I tell you the truth, whenever you did this for one of the least of these, one of the least of my brothers, 
you did so for me. Jesus does two things in that passage. One, he affirms that there will be a final judgment day. Two, he affirms that what we do on this earth matters. It deeply matters, and it will be brought to light. It will be shown. So that gives me comfort on the one side of my judgment problem, but the other side of my judgment problem remains very exposed. So what, what to do with this fact that there's a God I love, but I can never stand in front of him because of my flaws. So let's go to John chapter 12, verse 47, which reads, As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge them. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him on the last day. It appears there's a contradiction in what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I'm not the judge. I don't judge you. I'm here to save you. I'm here to save the world. But the tenses in John 12, 47, if you look at them closely, show that Jesus is speaking about two different judgments. Or what I say, lack of judging and saving in one time, but then in the future, a separate judgment. So that Matthew 25 judgment that's talked about on the last day, that is our future judgment. That's the final judgment of the world. But Jesus, when he was here on earth speaking about his mission here on earth, it was not to judge, it was to save. So we stand in between two judgments. The judgment of our sin was put on Jesus when he was walked this earth. And when he took that cross to, to his final breath on earth, which he uttered that it is finished. Jesus took the judgment of our sins in his saving death. And the judgment of the world will come on the final day to expel the meaningless of, of life and to right the painful wrongs of this broken world. And Tim Keller, another quote from Tim Keller, sums it up brilliantly. On the cross, Jesus Christ absolutely fulfilled the conditions of the law so God could love you absolutely unconditionally. With his perfect life, Jesus completely fulfilled the terms of the covenant. He earned the blessing, but with his sacrificial death, he completely fulfilled the curse of the covenant. And he leaves that blessing for you and me and anyone who lifts the empty hands of faith and asks for it. Remember when I was in that Sunday school, that last Sunday school class, and I was in that dark church sanctuary looking up at the crucifix and asking God for a sign? I was staring at the greatest sign that God had, has given us, that he is with us and that he loves us. And I didn't have eyes to see at that moment. I'm grateful now I have eyes to see Jesus in a totally different way. And I pray that you have eyes to see Jesus on that cross and to know the grace and the mercy that is intended for your spirit, intended for your soul, to allow you to let go of control of your life and trying to manage in this broken world and to allow Jesus to stand for you. And God, I, I pray, God, I pray that you allow us to take a deep breath, to think, to think through the implications of what we believe and how we live and to look at your son and his life on this earth and his death on the cross and to fully realize, have eyes to see, to fully realize the depth and the beauty and the grace that that sends to our spirit. God, thank you for loving us. God, I pray that you can just give us the calm and the quiet to sit with you today and to hear you and hear your voice. It's in your name we pray. Amen.